Today we're doing another Putnam video. In particular, we're going to look at the 2006 exam and we're going to look at question A5. So you guys have been asking me to do something more than just A1 and A2 and B1 and B2. So here's one from A5. So let's re just recall that there are six questions in the morning and six questions in the afternoon. So this is what's thought to be the next to hardest question in the morning session. Okay, so we want to let n be some natural number that is odd, and then theta is a real number that satisfies this condition, so theta over pi is not a rational number, so it's irrational. And then we want to set a sub k equal to the tangent evaluated at theta plus k times pi over n, and that's going to be true for k from 1 to n. And then our goal is to prove that the sum of a1 through an divided by the product of a1 through an is an integer. And then we want to find the value of that integer. So here's an observation to look at first. So this condition that theta over pi is not a rational number, that implies that tangent of theta plus k pi over n is never equal to 0. So that's actually pretty easy to check because we know a lot about the zeros of tangent. Also, it's ne never infinity. In other words, it is always in the domain as well. And that's because, again, we know the points that we have to take out of the domain of the tangent function. And furthermore, we know that all of these a k's are distinct. Again, and that's because we know something about the periodicity of the tangent function. So I won't go into those details. That's pretty obvious and something that you wouldn't have to put on a solution um, to this problem in the exam. And then here's some hints to think about if you want to try this problem by yourself before you look at my solution. So the first goal is maybe to construct a degree n polynomial whose roots are a1, a2, up to a n. And then this distinctness of the a k implies that that's going to be all of the roots of this degree n polynomial because we know degree n polynomials have at most n roots. And this next condition, actually we saw something similar to it on a pretty recent video involving a trigonometric identity in Chebyshev polynomials. And that says if this polynomial equation b sub 0 plus b1x all the way up to b sub m x to the m equals 0 has roots alpha 1 through alpha m, we want to look at the question what is the relationship between these coefficients b sub k and these roots of this polynomial alpha sub k. So we'll prove a little lemma speaking to the relation between the roots of such a polynomial and the coefficients. Think about these hints while you work on your own solution and now we're going to go through a solution. Now we're ready to look at a solution to this problem. Now the first thing that I'm going to do is set theta k equal to theta plus k pi over n. And that is going to make a sub k equal to tangent evaluated at theta k. So that's actually pretty helpful. And then again, like we pointed out in our first observation, we know that the a k are distinct and uh, not equal to zero because we have theta over pi is not a rational number. Now what we'll do is we'll construct a polynomial that has these a k's as roots. So let's uh, do that. We want to start with Euler's equation with theta k. So we have e to the i theta k is equal to cosine evaluated at theta k plus i times sine evaluated at theta k. And then likewise, we have e to the minus i theta k is equal to cosine evaluated at theta k minus i sine evaluated at theta k. So that's clearly because cosine is an even function and sine is an odd function. That's why that works out. Now what we want to do is take each of these equations and we're going to go ahead and multiply by 1 over cosine theta k. Great, and we again, we know that is non-zero because of this condition up here. Fantastic, so that's going to give us 1 over cos theta k times e to the i theta k equals 1 plus i times tangent theta k. Great, so obviously we multiplied by 1 over cosine so that we could get tangent of theta k built into this. And recall that tangent of theta k is a sub k, so we can just go ahead and say that this is 1 plus i times a sub k. Great.
Now we're going to do the same kind of thing for this second equation, and that's going to give us 1 over cos theta k times e to the minus i theta k equals 1 minus i tangent theta k, which is equal to 1 minus i times a k. Again, because a k is equal to tangent of theta k. Now the next thing that we want to do is mash these together in a way that we get rid of the cosine of theta k kind of thing. And how can we do that? Well, maybe what we'll do is we'll somehow get this term inside of this second equation. And we can do that by multiplying this whole second equation by something that will cancel this e to the minus i theta k out and it will bring it up to e to the i theta k and that turns out to be e to the 2i theta k. So notice that's going to cancel this up from a minus i theta k up to a positive i theta k. So let's see, that's going to give us a 1 over cos theta k e to the i theta k equals e to the 2i theta k and then 1 minus i a k. Now notice that we have a nice equation because we can go ahead and substitute this thing in to our first equation up here and that's going to give us something that mostly involves these a k. So let's see what we get when we do that. So that is going to give us e to the 2i theta k and then 1 minus i a k equals 1 plus i a k. Now the next thing that I want to do is raise this to the nth power because we want an n degree polynomial and that's going to give me e to the 2 n i theta k and then 1 minus i a k to the n equals 1 plus i a sub k to the n. Now what I want to do is bring that to the top and we'll move on to the next step. So far in our solution we've redefined these theta k to be theta plus pi k over n, and we have a k is equal to tangent of theta k, and then we constructed the following equation. So we have e to the 2 n i theta k times um, 1 minus i a k all to the nth power equals 1 plus i a k all to the nth power. But what we really want is our theta k's to only be inside of tangent which is equal to a k. In other words, the k dependence of this equation should only show up in the sequence that we're interested in. But in our case, it also shows up there. But actually, we're in a good spot because of the following equation. Notice if we have e to the 2 n i theta k, I'm going to replace theta k with its definition. So that is e to the 2 n i, and now we have theta plus pi k over n. So that's going to be equal to e uh, to the 2 n i theta times e to the 2 pi k times i. So I just used some exponent rules there, but that's pretty clear how that went. Now the next thing to notice is that this thing is kind of obviously cosine 2 pi k plus i sine 2 pi k. But sine 2 pi k is 0 and cosine 2 pi k is 1. And so that makes this whole thing just equal to e to the 2 n i theta. Notice that no longer depends on this k value. That's just a constant. It does depend on this theta which was fixed at the very beginning, but that's fixed to be a constant. So I'm going to go ahead and rename this thing omega. Great. And that gives me the following equation. Once I insert that into this, we have omega and then 1 minus i a k to the n power equals 1 plus i a k to the n power. But notice we can rewrite that fairly easily to be omega 1 minus i a k to the nth power minus 1 plus i a k to the nth power equals 0. And recall, this is true for all k equals 1, 2, up to n. So in other words, the a1, a2, all the way up to an are the 
So I'll put that uh, yellow and underlined. So they are the roots of the degree n polynomial defined as follows. So I'll call this thing P of X, and that is going to be omega 1 minus I X to the N minus 1 plus I X to the N. So notice that is a polynomial with complex coefficients, but it's still just a degree N polynomial. And we know that degree N polynomials have at most N roots, but we have found N distinct roots because we know these are all distinct by a previous discussion, which means we have found all of the roots. Okay, good. Now we're in a really good spot. I'll bring this up and we're going to prove a little bit of a lemma about the relationship between the roots of a polynomial and the coefficients of that polynomial and then we're basically home free. Great, let's see where we are. We have a1 up through an are the roots of the polynomial p of x, which is omega times 1 minus i x to the n minus 1 plus i x to the n. And now we need this lemma, which is going to basically finish the whole thing off. And that says if the roots of the polynomial f of x, which is b0 plus all the way up to bm x to the m, are alpha 1 up to alpha m, then the sum of these roots, alpha 1 plus dot 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 up to alpha m equals minus the m minus first coefficient divided by the mth coefficient. And then the product, alpha 1 up to alpha m equals minus 1 to the m, b0 over bm. Fantastic. So let's go ahead and see how this proof goes. And we'll see that it's actually not too bad. Notice we can take f of x and we can write it as b0 plus b1x all the way up to bm minus 1 x to the m minus 1 um, plus bm x to the m. So that is one way that we can write this thing. Another way that we can write this thing is to factor out the leading co coefficient and then factor it in terms of its roots. So it'll be bm and then x minus alpha 1 all the way up to x minus alpha m. So we've got this like sum product identity for polynomials and this is like fairly clear how this works. Now what we'll do is we'll just multiply out this right hand side and pay attention to the important coefficients that we're interested in. So in this case we're only really interested in bm, b0, and bm minus 1. So uh, let's go ahead and see what we get here. So notice if we were to multiply this thing out and look at what the constant term is, we will get the constant term by taking this bm and then choosing none of the x's in the product, which means we'll get minus x1 times minus x2 all the way up to minus xm. So that's going to give us minus 1 to the m um, and then alpha 1 all the way up to alpha m. Great. So just to reiterate, that is our constant term. So I'll underline both of those in yellow. Great. And now we can have plus dot 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 plus. Now let's look at the m minus first term because that's the next one that we're interested in. And we get the m minus first term by taking m minus one choices for x and a single choice for alpha. So notice this is always going to be attached to a minus one because we're choosing only one of those alphas. And then we still have a bm, and I just noticed that I missed my bm here, so let's fit that in there. And then we'll have the sum alpha 1 up to alpha m. So that's going to be x to the m minus 1. And then just to reiterate, this guy right here is exactly equal to this coefficient right here. And then finally, um, what we get for the last one is just bm x to the m because that's choosing m x's. Fantastic. Now what we can do is notice that these things follow immediately just by comparing the coefficients on the top side of the equation and the coefficients on the bottom side of the equation. So in other words, these yellow underlines will imply that b0 equals minus 1 to the m bm alpha 1 up to alpha m, which is exactly what we need in order to have that equality. And then these kind of peach colored underlines 
are going to imply that BM minus one equals minus uh, BM uh, alpha one plus up to alpha M. So that means we have proved this lemma. And now we're ready to look at the last step of our solution. We just got finished proving this lemma, and now we're gonna apply it to finish off our solution to this problem. Now I wanna expand this thing using the binomial theorem. So let's see, my first term is going to be omega, and then we're going to have the sum k equals zero to n. We're gonna have n choose k, and then minus i times x to the kth power. So I'll let you guys review the binomial theorem, but we're in the top end of Putnam problems, so this should be second nature if you intend on tackling these types of problems on test day. Great. And then we're going to have minus, now we have the sum k equals 0 to n of n choose k, and then we have i x to the k. Okay, so next what I want to do is notice that I can split this up into minus i to the k power times x to the k power, and then this is going to be i to the k power times x to the k power. So that's like a pretty obvious simplification, but it will help as we push these two sums together, which is what we'll do right now. So this is going to be now the sum k equals 0 to n. Okay, so now let's factor out as much as we can as we combine these together. So out of the left-hand side, I'd like to factor an i to the k, and notice that's just by trivially factoring this thing as i to the k times minus 1 to the k. So let's see, we can factor out an i to the k from the left, and then an n choose k also from the left. That's going to leave us with a minus 1 to the k times omega, so we have minus 1 to the k times omega minus 1, because that's what we have here. And then maybe factoring out of the right, we'll take this x to the k. So we've got x to the k there. Okay, great. Now, since this is kind of busy, what I'll do is I'll erase this calculation and just move this over before I move to the next step. So I've moved this thing over and now we're kind of ready to go. So let's look at our goal here. So we have a1 plus up to a n over a1 times up to a n. So notice this is the sum of the roots of p of x and this is the product of the roots of p of x. And recall that the sum of the roots of p of x is described by this formula right here. So I'm going to rewrite that in a slightly different way. So we'll have minus one, and then we'll have the coefficient uh, of x to the n minus one of p of x. So notice that's essentially the same thing as this b sub m minus one, just with the index changed and stuff like that. And then this is gonna be divided by the coefficient of x to the m of p of x. Great, so I've just applied this lemma that we proved to this numerator, just using slightly different notation. Now let's go ahead and do the same thing to this denominator. So that's going to give me minus one to the n, and we know it's to the n now because we've got n roots, and then we have b zero, so that's gonna be the coefficient of x to the zero, in other words, the constant term of p of x, divided by the coefficient of x to the m of p of x. Great. Now the next thing that we want to notice is that n is an odd number, so that makes this negative 1, and then this negative 1 will cancel with this negative 1. Great. And then another thing to notice is that we've got this term in the numerator and the denominator, so that also cancels. So now I'm running out of real estate here, so what I'll do is I'll erase this and I'll replace it with what we're left with, which is just this coefficient over this coefficient, and then we're almost done. Let's see where we are. We've simplified our problem down to this spot. So we have a1 plus all the way up to a n over a1 times all the way up to a n is the coefficient of x to the n minus one in p of x, where p of x is this polynomial, divided by the coefficient of x to the zero, in other words, the constant term of p of x, again, where we have that coefficient right there. But this is fantastic because these are easy to find just by setting k equal to n minus 1 and k equal to 0 since we've expanded this out in this nice way. So notice if we set k equal to n minus 1, we get i to the n minus 1, and then we have n choose n minus 1. 
Great. And then we're going to have minus 1 to the n minus 1. But recall that n was odd, which makes n minus 1 even, which means minus 1 to the n minus 1 is just um, 1. And so that's going to give us omega minus 1. Great. That's the coefficient of x to the n minus 1. Great. Now we're going to take that. We're going to divide it by the coefficient of x to the 0, which means we'll plug k equals 0 into all of these. So i to the 0 is 1. Then we have n choose 0. And then we have uh, minus 1 to the 0. And then finally, omega minus 1. Great. Now, a lot of this stuff simplifies pretty easily. So notice that omega minus 1 cancels this omega minus 1. And then again, we know that omega is not equal to 1 by our original assumption right there. And then next, we know that n choose 0 is just the number 1. n choose n minus 1 is the number n. So what that tells us is that this whole thing is equal to i to the n minus 1 times n. But let's recall that n is um, an odd integer, which makes n minus 1 an even integer, which means that this is plus or minus 1, depending on if n minus 1 is congruent to 0 mod 4 or 2 mod 4. And actually, we can see that this is equal to n, and that's going to be if n is congruent to 1 mod 4. So now let's talk through that. So if n is congruent to 1 mod 4, then n minus 1 is congruent to 0 mod 4, which makes i to the n minus 1 equal to um, positive 1. And then this is equal to minus n if n is congruent to 3 mod 4. And then just like we had before, um, n minus 1 is going to be congruent to 2 mod 4, which makes i to the n minus 1 equal to negative 1 in this case. And so that actually finishes this solution. Okay, great. We're done.